new light on the ancient tradition of inner knowing. Well, I don't know about you, but somehow this introduction reminds me of Lawrence Welk. If uh, any of you have such a long memory, you know why? A wonderful, a wonderful. You remember? A wonderful, a wonderful. Everything is wonderful. It seems that at different times of uh, one's life, one can sort of address oneself to uh, various aspects of one's interest as well as perhaps to various depths of uh, one's understanding. And so uh, 20 years ago, almost to the day, my uh, book, The Gnostic Jung, was published which was sort of really my first major contribution and which became a minor classic in that field because it was the first book that really established the uh, connection between C.G. Jung and the Gnostic tradition. And now, uh, 20 years later, I've, with the encouragement of my publisher, I got around to the um, subject proper in an introductory or basic form, which of course reminds me of a joke of some years ago, which hopefully you haven't heard or alternatively you have forgotten. In each case, it'll work, you know, about a... Uh, woman who, uh, in succession, had married quite a number of husbands. And the first husband was a banker. And the second husband was an owner of a movie theater, a movie exhibitor. And the third one was a minister, a preacher. And the last one was an undertaker. And when she commented on this sequence at some point, she said, well, the reason behind it is very simple. One for the money, two for the show. Three to get ready and four to go. So <laughs> that is how, you know, at different points of one's life, one can sort of undertake different projects, whether it's marital or literary or, uh, for that matter, you know, anything else. Well, with that bit of levity, we might try to address ourselves to the subject, and I'm sure it is no news to you at this particular curious and peculiar uh, juncture <laughs> of history that the issue of religion or, as it has been more recently euphemistically sometimes called spirituality, is one that is... Um, always present, uh, sometimes for uh, the better and sometimes for the worse, in the history of the world, and that in spite of various efforts periodically toward secularism, toward atheism, or various other moves of that nature, never goes away. And so we find, of course, most glaringly, the shadow side of religion today as manifest in the various forms of fundamentalism, most recently the fundamentalism coming from Islamic sources. But, of course, there are others around, including our uh, homegrown domestic corn-fed variety of fundamentalisms as well. But that is not all. There are other really interesting developments taking place, which I would like to take sort of as the point of departure this morning. In fact, I would like to recommend to you the October issue of um, the Atlantic Monthly, which, unlike so many other publications, is still a quite interesting magazine with good material in it. And the lead article in that issue is an article entitled The Next Christianity by Philip Jenkins, who is a distinguished professor from Pennsylvania State University, both in religious studies and in uh, history. Now, not all distinguished professors write all that distinguished stuff. I've seen, I've seen a lot of just gosh awful things coming from such sources, but this one is not one of them, so I recommend you to read it. Uh, in any event, to um, put it very briefly, what Professor Jenkins is writing about here, and I think his basic data appear to be pretty unimpeachable, is that there is, let's say, an approach, in this instance, to the Christian religion, going by leaps and bounds, which, according to the uh, current statistics, is in fairly short order likely to um, totally overtake mainstream or even uh, evangelical Christianity as it is known in the West, in Europe, in Britain, and in the United States and Canada. And this refers to a Southern Christianity. Now, he doesn't mean Southern Baptism or Christianity from Tennessee or um, from Georgia, but rather he means the Christianity that exists and that is growing in Africa and in uh, Central and South America, and to some degree also to in smaller numbers in Asia. Now, uh, and it's not my purpose to review the professor's thesis here, but this is a very interesting development, because this form of Christianity is very, very different from what is going on in uh, religious circles in uh, the West. And it has many features. Some of them are ones that probably uh, most of us would not be all that happy about. Others, however, are, I think, at least very telling. Because for one thing, even though the author does not use that term, I will use the term, this is to a major extent a magical and supernatural Christianity. In other words, to come to grips with it at an even more fundamental level, the millions and millions of people, very good, uh, very devout, very dedicated religious people in Africa, in South America, and some of them in Asia, will not take a religion that does not afford them religious experience. Not theory, not politics, not sociology, not psychology, <laughs> but religious experience. You know, for instance, just by way of statistics, that Nigeria alone 
has more practicing church members of the Anglican communion than Great Britain, where it started, and where it's the state religion. You know? That kind of indicates to you what is going on. And particularly in the religions like the Anglican communion, the Roman Catholic Church, and so forth, which are worldwide denominations, owing to the exceedingly large numbers and growing large numbers in these countries, this element is becoming the majority and will become normative in terms of what these churches do. So that is, on the practical level, very, very significant. But for my purposes, what is significant is that after about 200 years of, let's say, uh, a kind of moving away from the supernatural, the spiritually experiential, and let's face it, the divine element and objective of religion, at least in Western culture, this element is now reasserting itself with tremendous power and perhaps even vengeance, and that this is a phenomenon which will need to be very seriously taken into consideration by everybody. Now, um, how does religion, religious traditions, spiritual traditions, whatever you call them, and you heard me say, some of you have heard me say this several times, so I'll make it also as brief as possible, but it's an essential point. How do they start? Well, not only there are all kinds of theories about this sort of thing, but in my view, they start very much with that element which now is emphasized in this particular fashion, as just indicated, namely with transcendental experience. Somebody somewhere, or a group of people somewhere, have an experience that is of a non-ordinary nature, that transcends ordinary human experience, that is radically and essentially different. And not only different in a sort of horizontal way, in which I don't know a blonde person is different from a brunette, but different in what one might envision in a vertical dimension. Another world, another realm of experience, another kind of reality. And it is this other, the holy other, as some of the theologians called it, 20th century theologians, the holy other is contacted, is touched. Sometimes uh, in a very, very powerful, deep and intimate way, and sometimes perhaps not quite as powerfully, by some people, who then, as one eventually must, and this is of course the metaphor of Moses, say, and some other religious founders and prophets going up on the mountain, up above everything else, a different level of consciousness, as it were. Eventually, when one goes up the mountain, unless one is prepared to stay there for the rest of one's life, one has to come down. So they always come down to this kind of consciousness, and then they feel that something ought to be done about this that they had this highly unusual, tremendously exciting, and really uh, inwardly inspiring, galvanizing, electrifying experience, that this should somehow be communicated, it should somehow be made available to others. And then they gather disciples around them. Whether it's Buddha after his experience under the tree of enlightenment at Gaia, or um, whether it's Muhammad after he uh, comes out of the cave where he had his experience, and so on and so forth, everyone else. Now they begin to try to communicate about this, which is of course never easy because you need to uh, attempt to translate from a reality that is so radically different from this one that it's very difficult to do. However, it's much easier usually for the person who had the experience than someone who did not have the experience talking about it generations later. However, the generations do pass and now people begin to get concerned about how is this communication going to continue and then they begin to write about it and that's how sacred literature comes about. Practically all of the great founders of religions themselves, Zarathustra, Buddha, Jesus, did not write any books. Prophet Muhammad didn't know how to write, he had to dictate. <laughs> so generally the writing comes later on. And now you have sacred scripture, now you have the Bibles, various sacred canons of scriptures. And time goes on, and now all there is, is the scripture. This is the only thing that remains from the original experience. And obviously, the scripture itself then becomes ever more exalted and regarded as terribly sacred and terribly inspired because that's all the people have. That is the treasure that they still have. And then from the scripture, they begin to extrapolate various teachings, usually of two kinds, one being in the nature of beliefs. There is a pejorative word for it that has become a pejorative word in our culture, dogma. I think most people think of a vicious dog when they think of a dog, you know, <laughs> sort of an automatic association, but it's, it's not, it's not, it wasn't really meant that way, it just meant an article of belief, an article of faith. So there are belief on the one hand, and rules, laws, uh, rules of behavior, commandments on the other hand, and that's usually where the process stops. And that's kind of where things are if you go into any or let's say not any, the overwhelming majority of the churches, the synagogues, the mosques, to just mention a few these days. That is where things have remained. And that is what disturbs and annoys people who are very close to their, let's say, some of the energies in their soul. 
such as the people from the southern hemisphere we were referring to, is not enough for them. They are not really that interested in these graven mental images that we have carved. They want to experience. And that's not easy to do, because sooner or later this process of degeneration again takes place. So really, humanity, to a major extent, in many places, and certainly in the cultural and religious milieu of our own, which is often referred to as Judeo-Christian, but now with the increase of diversity, maybe we'll have to call it Budio, Judeo, Islam, or um, whatever, Christian too, I don't know, it might sound good, or not. <laughs> but, uh, um, but, you know, we are certainly within this uh, matrix, we encounter that particular phenomenon that things have come to that sort of a frozen level of the extrapolation of doctrine to believe in and of rules to follow as they are extrapolated from scripture, and it's not going anywhere beyond that. Now, it is my contention that there always was, and there continues to be, however, a small minority of humanity who did not go about this process in the manner in which I have just indicated. But rather, this approach, while appreciative of the original experience and the original impulse, and also often creating its own scriptures of one kind or the other, maintained the uh, attitude and the intention of somehow, if at all possible, continuing with experience. You can see that impulse erupting again and again in various ways. For instance, one of the fundamental teachings of the most rapidly growing religion in America, for instance, namely the Mormon faith, the Church of the Latter-day Saints, this was the cardinal recognition or proclamation of Joseph Smith that prophecy has not come to an end. And by prophecy he did not mean foretelling the future, but rather the prophetic interaction with the transcendental dimension with God and the angels and so forth. That it's not something that happened way back then and now we have to believe in it, but that it can happen now. Now, I don't mean to say that that continued to be very effectively implemented after the tragic murder of Joseph Smith in the Mormon faith or anywhere else, but certainly there was a recognition. These recognitions pop up again and again in history. Or to put it in other terms, in cognitive terms, that you can know. You don't just have to believe. You don't just have to listen. You don't just have to read. You can know. Now, that knowing, however, we have to keep in mind, is not the sort of knowing that we usually designate by that term. It doesn't have to do with knowing of facts. Facts, you know, are, well, facts are facts, what can you say? But as Anagarika Govinda, that great pioneer of Buddhism in this country and in California, once pointed out, you cannot argue with a fact if it's really a fact. A fact is a fact. But as he implied, that's where it stops. A fact isn't going anywhere. <laughs> The fact stays where it is, you know, until it ceases to be a fact for some reason or the other. It's an end product. So in another way you might say a fact is never particularly creative, right? So we are not talking about knowledge of facts. And that this knowledge is also not really or primarily philosophical knowledge, as understood, let's say, by Greek philosophy and otherwise, because it is not a knowing of ideas or theories, no matter how meritorious these ideas and theories might be. So it's not philosophical knowledge either. Or as the Neoplatonists said, not fact, not truth, but reality. <laughs> so there was recognized, let's say, by various people throughout the ages, an other realm, which is neither factual knowledge nor theoretical knowledge, but which is a knowing, a knowingness, an intimate, first-hand, personal knowing, intuitively arrived at, that's probably you know, as close as we can come to it in terms of describing it, but which in its effects is nevertheless tremendously, tremendously powerful and overwhelming, or overwhelmingly powerful. And this knowing is what in the Greek language was called, is called gnosis, with a G, because in Greek it's gnosis, in English the G is silent. Now, um, so far so good. But now the next question is, how do you arrive at this? If people say that this can be had, that you don't have to just believe, that you don't just have to read, you just don't have to talk, you just don't have to listen, but you can actually know, okay, how? How do you go about it? And I, there's the rub. <laughs> um, but let's say in various periods of history, in various cultures, people always found means whereby they uh, would arrive at, avail themselves of such knowledge of one kind or the other. If you um, study this sort of from the point of view of cultural anthropology and you know, go back to very early periods of history or the remnants of these earlier periods of history as they are present. Now, living remnants, you know, archaic native cultures and so forth, you see that in their own way and within the parameters of their, uh, their functioning and their culture and their behavior and consciousness, the so-called what used to be called primitive peoples, that somewhat pejorative term isn't used that much anymore, but let's say archaic peoples, found ways of having such experiences, all kinds. <laughs> 
I won't quit, was there. There are people there who know. Even that old rascal, was not that old, but certainly rascal, fellow Californian of ours, Carlos Castaneda, whom some of you may remember, Chestnut Charlie, as I was wont to call him, you know, I mean, Castaneda, you know, what else? <laughs> you know, had translated the term for the shaman, for the sorcerer, as a man of knowledge. A man of knowledge. Yeah. What kind of knowledge? Not knowledge of computers, not knowledge of theorems, but that kind of knowledge. So that kind of knowledge has always been in the world. And it goes on. Look at the period just preceding uh, the coming of Christianity and so forth. You had the mysteries. Well, they had the mysteries. The Greeks primarily who, who developed this in a very distinct and very institutionalized, very clear fashion. And these were institutions supported and recognized by society, which is certainly a lot more than, than can be said later on in the culture, wherein this kind of transcendental, imperative, liberating knowledge was practiced, imparted in a place like the Eleusinian Mysteries, where sometimes several thousand people went through the mystery and had the liberating experience in the Telesterion in Eleusis, these people maintained the results of their internal illumination, transformation, liberation for the rest of their lives. One of the principal results of it having been, according to the reports of contemporaries who wrote about this, that they all lost totally and completely the fear of death. Now, when you can do that, then you have done something rather significant, I think. You know, you don't really get that from theory. You, know? you can theorize forever that you're going to go to heaven, or you can theorize forever that you're going to reincarnate as something much more wonderful, or somebody, maybe something much more wonderful, somebody much more wonderful and much more successful and much more beautiful and much more rich and much more healthy than you have been in this lifetime. But you know what? You don't really know. You don't really know. You can fantasize about it. You can even believe it. But neither fantasizing nor believing is knowing. Knowing is... You know, something else. When you know, you know. <laughs> uh, and then, when it came up to the point where Christianity started, then you might say this approach now translated itself and came forth within a somewhat different context. Of course, the inspiration of Greece often by way of Rome, was still there very powerfully. It was not even, uh, let's say, the Egyptian, especially not by that time the Egyptian, but the Egyptian or the Hebrew or the Syrian or the Babylonian culture at that time was transfused with the inspiration from the Greeks. So certainly the mystery element from there and also from other sources, because we certainly can't discount the Egyptian mysteries and so forth. But let's say the mystery approach was certainly there. And so it is perfectly evident, and this is not a matter of dispute, that from the very beginning of the formation of the Christian religion, there was an element quite powerful, quite large, quite cultured and respected at that, in association with or part of the Christian community to which other people primarily applied the term Gnostic. Those people who know something. Just like the Mormons didn't really call themselves Mormons. <laughs> uh, you know, other people called them that. And this element was definitely very much present, very much there. And it pointed to the founder of the Christian religion, to Jesus, and beyond Jesus to the tradition, the Hebrew tradition primarily, out of which this new religion emerged, and said, you know, this kind of Gnosis was always here, and it still is. We haven't started it at this particular time. Now, a person not very well acquainted with this subject might say, well, do you mean to say that what these people at that time or their successors today, that what they mean is that there is no need really for anything else, only this knowledge, only this experience? Well, in a certain sense, yes. In a certain sense, no. <laughs> you know? In the sense that for the uh, inner illumination, the spiritually firing up of your being, such experience is essential. In that sense, yes, the experience is practically all that matters. But in the sense of having this experience truly useful in the long run in your life, for the results of the experience to become first, let's say, amplified, that's a term that C.G. Jung used, and eventually assimilated into your life, something in addition to this is needed. What is this something in addition? This additional factor is a world view, as I call it which is a translation, at least in my mind, because I know that language, <laughs> translation of the German word Weltanschauung, the way you view the world, world view. Max Heindel called it cosmoconception. <laughs> it was, of course, also a German. <laughs> in any event, what is that? Well, we need to keep in mind that mystics, maybe particularly mystics, mystics, Gnostics, knowers, experiencers, shamans, whatever you want to call them in different times and different cultures, don't have their experiences and don't lead their lives in a vacuum, in a conceptual vacuum. And therefore, when the transcendental experience, let's say, in its effects, comes down, percolates down, dribbles down to the levels of the human ego and the human mind, there must be means there whereby it can be processed, 
pardon that expression, reminds me too much of uh, less expensive and less palatable forms of cheese, you know, it's processed. <laughs> but then you hear the preachers on the TV talking, you know, hollering about, in the name of Jesus, you know, that, that also, that also reminds me of cheese. So there you, there you go. I don't know, this is, this must be sort of the dairy product Sunday today, or some, something or the other. <laughs> but in any event, there has to be a way in which this experience becomes useful to the individual for a long period of time because no one, not even the, the, the greatest Gnostic master can guarantee you great experiences of Gnosis at 5 o'clock every Tuesday or maybe even on Tuesday and on Wednesday. When it comes, then one has to be able to do something with it. And this is where, let's say, the worldview comes in. Now, the problem, and I certainly don't mean to sound this derogatory, the problem with a great deal of Christian mysticism, even its highest, St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa, you know, St. Bernard, is that the worldview, the official worldview, that these folks adhered to and were supposed to adhere to, or else the Inquisition was going to come to get them, which certainly St. John of the Cross knew a good deal about, their worldview was not particularly suited for the assimilation of this transcendental experience. And if you have ever read St. John of the Cross, the popular name for the book being The Dark Knight of the Soul, but it's really other than that, there's a magnificent mystical poem now that's Gnostic. <laughs> you see? The poem describes his experience, the love poem of the divine in the night. It's fabulous. But then when poor St. John tries to explain it, he constantly runs into the worldview of conventional Catholic doctrine at that time, and it doesn't work terribly well. So what you need is a worldview which in itself originates within such experience, and which is therefore harmonized and synchronized with it. Within that worldview, the transcendental experience will produce its optimum effect. It may still produce some effect elsewhere, but it will not be the optimum effect. And so we have, therefore, the experience of Gnosis on the one hand, and then we have the Gnostic worldview on the other. Of the experience, of course, not a great deal can be stated verbally, whether that verbal statement be in speech or in writing. Such experience is always a little bit like the wind, which has been the symbol of the spirit since time began, which bloweth where it listeth, and you can see what the wind does, but you can't see the wind. You can see the flag flying in the wind, you can see the tree bending in the wind, but you can't see the wind. But that's the way it is really with real transcendental Gnostic experience. Yet, some things can be said about it. Some fairly good things have been said about it, both in the distant past and more recently, and in the early portion of my book I have uh, included this. But then comes the Gnostic worldview. Now, this worldview is very different in certain ways from the worldview that has developed both in... Um, conventional, uh, let's say, Judeo-Christianity, or for that matter, in the more secularized worldview that has come upon our culture within the last couple of centuries. And of course it is different. <laughs> Why is it different? Because it addresses itself to an entirely different kind of experience. If you are dealing with the experience of facts, most of conventional religion and the conventional secular uh, philosophy, if you can call it that, of our culture will suffice. If you address yourself to ideas, some of these will still suffice. But when you are dealing with the Holy Order, there isn't much around, there isn't much available by way of worldview that will suffice. All the cups into which you try to pour your transcendental experience will be inadequate. Some will be too small, and some will be leaking. Oh, well, let, oh, let me go through all of that, that nonsense. <laughs> you know, anyway, they will, they will not work. The Gnostic one was so designed because it was designed by people who had the experience. Now, what am I talking about? For instance, there's a couple of very disturbing things. They might as well throw them at you, because then if you read about them, then you will find them less disturbing maybe than, than you find them now. One of them is that the managing, ruling, determining, creative agency associated with our world, commonly referred to in the monotheistic matrix as God, is not the true and the ultimate deity. Heresy, blasphemy, awful. If you are going to believe in a God at all, you want to believe one who is wonderful and who is here and who runs everything. But the Gnostic said, oh yeah? If, uh, uh, <laughs> if you have an utterly wise, completely just, all-knowing and all-powerful deity making and remaining in charge of this world, how come there is so that much wrong with it? How come? Oh, well, an Orthodox Christian, oh yeah, it's because Adam and Eve messed it up. <laughs> See? And that's called original sin and all this sort of thing. Well, you know, give me a break. 
Uh, and the Gnostic said way back then, the first century, second century, mind you, they said, give me a break. <laughs> because they wrote alternative versions of Genesis, which definitely had the intent of turning this upside down and taking that whole mythos, the guilt mythos of the original sin, away. But what did they say? Yes, there are forces here that are neither all that smart nor perhaps all that good that seem to be running a lot of the show. Now that may sound very depressing at first. Oh dear. I mean, if the management of the world, of the universe, is somewhat in the same shape as the management of the various countries that we live in, if the government up there is just as weird as the government down here, well, geez, then maybe I just don't want to live. You know, I mean, this is terrible. <laughs> yes, it would be. If the additional factor were not introduced, and the additional factor is, you know what, it is that way, but there is something beyond. And you have the capacity within you to break through the barriers that keep you locked in within the dicey-ness of the world. You can penetrate to that ultimate reality. And if you penetrate to it in consciousness, even just for a little while right now, your freedom from the uh, awfulness <laughs> of the wretchedness that goes on beyond will increase immeasurably. It's not brought about by fact. It's not brought about by theory. Use the Christian term. It's not brought about by faith. It's not brought about by works. It's brought about by consciousness. Consciousness which is gnosis, liberating knowledge. Now, the mind needs to approach these issues, usually, within a certain context, within a certain imagery. Because we don't do terribly well with abstractions. They give us a headache. I think a lot of abstract thinking is the original crown of thorns. It even gave Jesus Christ a monumental headache, you know. <laughs> but that is why the Gnostic scriptures, if you pick them up, such as say the Naj Hammadi Library and the various ones that I quote here and so forth, will not tell you these data, or whatever you want to call them, these ideas in abstract terms. But they will tell them to you in mythic terms. They will tell them to you in the form of story and imagery and images of various kinds. Truth did not come into the world naked, says one of the Gnostic scriptures, Gospel of Philip, but it came in the images. And therefore these are expressed mythologically, so you have beings there. You have a kind of a great big spirit, like a great big angel, who comes forth originally from the ultimate deity, but then becomes alienated from that, and this becomes the demiurge who um, puts the world together and continues to run it in his own flawed image, shall we say. Now, do I or any Gnostic ask you, or this book asks you to necessarily believe in such a being quite literally? No. Some do. Maybe rightfully so. I won't reveal to you what I do, <laughs> or how I do. But what it is, it communicates a certain reality, that we are effectively closed off from the greater consciousness, and that there are not just at the outer physical and political and economic level inimical forces, enemies around in the world, but there are forces that at least appear to be intent upon keeping us unconscious. George Ivanovich Gurdjieff made a lot out of this in his particular mythos. And he said, most people are sleepwalkers in terms of consciousness, and they just don't know what's going on. <laughs> but the reason for it is that there are some forces that are keeping them such. Now, once again, you can personify these or not. But the important thing is that we can, when we learn how, we can deal with this. We can break through these barriers. We can come to liberating knowledge. And in the same way, sorry to say, at least the Christian Gnosis, the Gnostic Christianity, will not tell you that by his death on the cross and all that went on, that by these sad and sorrowful events, Jesus Christ saved the world. He said that is not the way salvation comes about. That indeed may have happened, but those happenings were not as monumentally and transcendentally connected with the work of liberation of salvation as the so-called Orthodox claim. What the Gnostics will say is that, yes, this being came from outside, came from the great light, came from total consciousness, from pleroma and fullness, and then did two things. He imparted teaching that would stimulate you toward Gnosis and also allow you to form a Gnostic worldview. And on the other hand, quite important, he brought mysteries, because it is in the mystery that the Gnosis comes, not in the teaching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and with these two things, he gave people means whereby they can work for and ultimately achieve this sort of liberating Gnosis. So I'll conclude on the keynote that, yes, if you still want to persist, let's say, in the uh, sometimes tacit and sometimes not so tacit assumption of the secular culture within which we live and which we have cultivated for about a couple of hundred years now, until it just became really too much to deal with, if you want to adhere to that underlying assumption that in spite of all the nice talk about spirituality and this, that, and the other thing, this physical world is all there is, plus your mind and its projections, then forget it. <laughs>
Forget this book and forget everything else. Because far from it, this kind of knowledge, knowing, inner knowing, is designed to liberate you precisely from that kind of projections. And similarly, if you um, want to persist in the notion that in spite of its horror, its ongoing and relentless and unrelieved suffering, its weird and counterproductive and terrible events, this world is wonderful, is good, is terrific, is based on perfect goodness and perfect justice, then also forget it. I'll willingly forego my small royalty, all too small. <laughs> that might come from your soul. But if you have come at least to some degree to recognize that something is wrong with you and with the reality within which you work and within which you live, and that you might want to break out of that confinement to something better, to something greater, you might want to be liberated from that then definitely look into this matter. I know quite a few of you have done so already. Look into it further and perhaps gain a, a sort of basic information about it as far as one can give from this particular book. And I promise you, on the basis of a long and increasingly long and by now somewhat onerous life, most of which I have spent in the uh, pursuit of Gnosis since about the age 12. Okay, now that's, that goes back a long ways, I'm afraid to say. You know, I can promise you on the basis of that experience that your pursuit of this will be very rewarding. More rewarding than you can imagine. More rewarding than you have heard, than you have read, than you have fantasized. More rewarding than anything encountered thus far. I hope that those rewards will come to many of us and will continue coming, because you know when it's all said and done, that kind of inner liberating knowing has no equal, has no parallel. And ultimately, that is really all that truly matters. Thank you. Copyright NM Catalog by BC Recordings. Catalog number 100100. For more information about available lecture titles and for many other resources, visit gnosis.org. That's G-N-O-S-I-S dot O-R-G.